Have you ever wondered how your computer decides what to work on next? Well, today we're going to talk about it. So welcome to my operating systems class. Seriously, I'm traveling right now, or at least I will be when this video goes public. And so since I can't be there physically, I'm posting my lecture material today online in the form of this video. As a result, this video is going to be a little bit longer than usual and a bit more conceptual than you're used to. But still, I'm going to try to move pretty quickly because I don't want this video to get huge. So today we're going to talk about how an operating system schedules its tasks. Modern operating systems schedule their tasks on different timescales, so they make a bunch of different scheduling decisions. Uh, often we think about this happening on three different timescales. We, we talk about the long-term scheduler, the mid-term scheduler, and the short-term scheduler. The long-term scheduler decides which processes are going to run on the system. Some operating systems may allow any processes to run on the system. They may just say, yeah, sure, run whatever you want. Others may be more careful and actually have admission control systems that make decisions when you try to run a process, when a task comes in that says, hey, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to accept this task. It's just not this, I can't run it for whatever reason. The midterm scheduler decides how many processes are going to be running on the CPU actively right now. It wants to use the CPU and the memory as efficiently as possible. And so what it's going to do is it's going to actually go through the processes and it's going to figure out which ones are going to be actively on the CPU and which ones are going to be paged out to disk. The short-term scheduler's job is to simply execute tasks as efficiently as possible. Ideally, so that if there is work to be done, the CPU isn't sitting there idle doing nothing. Today we're going to talk about the short-term scheduler, but first a few preliminaries. First, let's make sure we're all using the same mental model. We have a machine with a bunch of processes or threads, and they're each in different state. Some may just have been created, others may be actively running on the CPU, some may be waiting for I.O. or something else, uh, others may be ready to run, they're just sitting on a queue because you can only run so many things at once. Some may have maybe done and are waiting to be cleaned up, so each of these processes or threads are actually in different states. So you should also think about each of these processes as having a series of bursts. So, so every process that runs is basically using the CPU some of the time and other times are waiting for I.O. or something else when they're not actually needing the CPU, but they're, they're still waiting for something to happen. They're waiting for a mouse click, a key press, something from the disk, something from the network. The point is you're gonna have periods of time when you're using the CPU and periods of the time when you're waiting when you're not using the CPU. And if a process has lots of big CPU bursts and very few I.O. bursts, we typically call this an, a CPU bound process. On the other hand, if your process has mostly I.O., it's mostly just waiting all the time and responding to I.O. events when they occur, we call this an I.O. bound process. And also, now I just called them bursts, but we can also, sometimes you're going to hear them called tasks and jobs and Probably before this video is over, I'm going to refer to them as burst tasks and jobs. It's okay, I'm referring to the same thing. I'm referring essentially to CPU bursts and that's what we're scheduling. We got a bunch of CPU bursts and we're going to try to figure out which ones we run when. Also, we need to set some rules for our scheduler. Typically, schedulers come in two varieties. You have cooperative schedulers and you have preemptive schedulers. Cooperative schedulers essentially run tasks to completion. A new task comes in, we decide which task to run. That task runs until it's finished. Then that task basically makes a syscall and gives up the CPU cooperatively. So, so, the, so these schedulers are called cooperative because we're essentially waiting for the process to give the CPU back. A preemptive scheduler sets a timer, and when that timer goes off, it takes control back. So it's going to interrupt the process after a certain amount of time. That amount of time, the amount of time we set the timer for, is called the quantum. So cooperative, preemptive. And after that interruption, the preemptive scheduler can still run the same process it was running if it wants, but the point is it has a choice. It, it makes a, another decision. It, it can either run the same job or it can run a different job. And the quantum actually matters to how the scheduler works. You can imagine it this way. If you have a very, very long scheduling quantum, then it's basically going to just be like any other cooperative scheduler. Uh, your system may not be very responsive because a process may hold the CPU for a long time and other processes that want to run may not get a chance. On the other hand, if you set the quantum super, super small, well, you may run into other problems because now you're switching all the time. And so you may end up actually spending so much time switching that you're not actually getting any work done. Modern CPUs make this a little better by using hyperthreading, which, which basically gets rid of a lot of the overhead of thread switching. But still, the point is that you, you want to pick a quantum that actually makes sense for your workload and that gives you the responsiveness you want, but doesn't cause you to spend all of your time in switching. It's important to note that most modern operating systems use preemptive schedulers. And that's because, let's face it, software to download it over the internet, we can't guarantee that it's going to cooperate with anyone. And so... 
preemptive is safest. We just don't know what we're dealing with. Cooperative schedulers do have some advantages though. They're much simpler to implement and they often have less overhead. So a lot of the embedded systems that I build through my research, if they have a scheduler at all, it's usually a cooperative scheduler. And also really quick, before we dive into specific algorithms, let's talk about what makes a good scheduler. Of course, we know that a scheduler is trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, brave, but seriously, you might want your scheduler to be fair. You probably want it to be efficient. You want it to make decisions quickly. You really want your computer to get work done, not spend all of its time scheduling. You might care how many jobs per second it finishes. You might care how responsive those jobs are. You might have certain jobs that are more important than others, and so priority may come into play. You may want to avoid starvation to make sure that low priority jobs don't get starved and never run. You might want to minimize the amount of time that a job is actually sitting around waiting, or you might want to minimize the what we call the turnaround time or the response time, which is the time from when you submit the job to when it's complete. So those are a few ideas. We'll get more specific in a minute. But now let's talk about algorithms. I want to talk about three today. Probably the simplest algorithm that you can come up with is first come, first serve. Sometimes this is called FIFO, which is first in, first out. Uh, this is really simple. Basically tasks arrive and they're serviced, they're executed in the order that they came. So we take the first job that arrived and we run it. We take the second job that arrived and we run it. We take the third job, you get the picture. We're basically taking the first in and we're executing it first. First come, first serve is really simple. You don't need any unnecessary switching and you don't need preemption. So our second algorithm is round robin. And it's a lot like first come, first serve, but instead of running each job to completion, we run each job for one quantum and then we switch to the next one in the order they arrived. So we give each task a quantum and then we switch to the next, give it a quantum, switch to the next, give it a quantum, and we basically rotate through until the tasks are done. The third algorithm I want to talk about is shortest job first or SJF. This is also referred to as shortest remaining time first, which is actually a little more accurate since that's what it does, but shortest job first is easier to say, so that's, I guess, what's stuck. With shortest job first, we look at the list of jobs that are available and we, and we look at the one that has the least amount of time left. So essentially the shortest remaining work, we, we pick that one and we execute it first. So those are our three algorithms for today. Now let's see them in action. So let's say we have the following tasks. They show up at different times. They have different lengths. The times listed are in quanta, just for simplicity. And let's assume that they always use a full quantum. Okay? In reality, they may only use part of a quantum. For our purposes, we'll just assume they use a full quantum. And we're going to look at a few different metrics. We're going to look at the total amount of time that it takes to complete all the tasks. We're going to look at response times. So we're going to look at essentially how long it takes from when tasks arrive to when they complete. And we're going to look at wait time, which is essentially how long the task was here and could be run, but wasn't. Basically, it was just waiting around, not running. So in first come, first serve, the tasks finish in order. And this is a particularly bad case because the first task was a long one. So the others have to wait. And it took 13 quanta to run all the tasks. We have average response times of 7, 9, and 10, which gives us an average of 8.66, roughly. And our wait times are zero, because the first one didn't have to wait, five and eight. And so, so on average, tasks are waiting 4.3 quanta. For round robin, the smaller tasks don't have to wait until the first task is done. In this case, our average numbers come out about the same, but things are very different for the individual processes. Specifically, you'll notice that tasks two and three actually finish quite a bit sooner. So now let's look at SJF. In this example, I'm assuming we're using preemption. If not, we will end up with very little benefit because the tasks are arriving at different. In, in this case, when task two arrived, we're already working on task one. And so it still has to wait a long time because task one is so big. Uh, you do get a little bit of a change because task three then runs before task two. So, so that does change things up a little. You notice that uh, you do have a slightly smaller average response time and a slightly smaller average wait time. When SJF is preemptive, we see a more significant difference. Tasks one and two are both interrupted and delayed to make way for the smaller task three, and the consequence is a noticeable drop in average response times and wait times. And in fact, if all you care about is average response time, then SJF is always the way to go. SJF will always give you the lowest average response times. And we should back up a little. When do we care about average response times? Specifically, we care about average response times when we're dealing with interactive programs. So interactive programs, these are typically programs with some kind of interactive UI. An interactive program is generally not doing a whole lot most of the time. It's usually just waiting for keystrokes, mouse clicks, network events, some kind of, there's some kind of interaction and you get little CPU bursts followed by big weights. So these are IO bound processes. And these interactive processes usually don't tax the CPU very much, but we care a lot how quickly they respond to those mouse clicks and keystrokes. So now before we move on, SJF has some problems. I want to talk about them. The first is, is that if short jobs keep showing up and keep, keep interrupting longer jobs, the longer jobs may never run. They may get starved. 
They just get delayed and delayed and delayed and eventually they just, they just never run. SJF is an example of a simple priority scheduling scheme. And this is something that's true of any simple priority scheduling scheme. If you are prioritizing tasks based on some attribute of the tasks, then low priority tasks always have the risk of getting pushed off to the end. And we can handle this in a couple of ways. One thing we can do is we can actually age our priorities. What this means is that the longer a task is in the list, you can slowly increment its priority so eventually it's gonna get run. The other way to handle it is through randomization. With randomization, you still assign priorities, but they come in the form of probabilities. So you basically assign probabilities to each task that's going to run, and you just make sure that no probabilities get too close to zero. So now you're randomly selecting tasks based on their probabilities, and you're still giving preference to your higher priority tasks, but your lower priority tasks will still eventually run. So those are two simple ways that you can prevent starvation. So the other problem with SJF is more fundamental. And that is that we don't really have a good way of predicting how long these tasks are gonna be. I mean, I wrote them in the table like, hey, this task is gonna take seven quanta, but in reality, we don't have a good way of telling how long any particular task is gonna take. There's a little thing called the halting problem that says that in general, predicting how long any piece of software is gonna run is, well, it's the definition of a hard problem. It's basically provably unsolvable, and so we're definitely not gonna tackle that here. The point is we can't accurately determine how long a job is going to take to run, but we can use some very simple predictors to try to do a, a reasonable job at guessing. And often simple predictors work fairly well. We could actually say that we expect previous tasks from the same process to be about the same length. We can use history to predict the future. One predictor that we, could, that we might use is an exponentially weighted moving average. Sometimes that's called a Yuma. So mathematically, it's essentially gonna look like this. The next prediction is computed from the last prediction and what actually happened last time. So the measured, the time the burst actually takes. The alpha value simply tells us how heavily we want to weight each one. So if alpha is one, then we ignore reality and we just go with the last prediction. This is a bad idea. If alpha is close to zero, we predict almost solely based on the last experience and setting alpha to somewhere like 0.5 is gonna weight them equally. Now this predictor isn't sophisticated and there are definitely times when it's gonna perform badly. For example, if you ever have a process that does long bursts followed by short bursts and alternates them, this predictor is not gonna do very well. But I mention it because its simplicity can be a strength. I really wanna highlight here that simple predictors are best here be because remember, you're making scheduling decisions very frequently. You might be making the scheduling decision every 10 milliseconds or maybe even faster. And you can come up with some fancy machine learning based predictor that's gonna accurately predict burst lengths, but it's gonna kill performance. Whatever predictor you use, it has to be fast. So anyway, this gives you a, a quick overview of some simple scheduling algorithms. For those of you in my class, be sure you know how these work because these kinds of scheduling scenarios make great quiz and test questions that's definitely gonna show up. So make sure that you understand this. And we're almost done, but I wanna mention just a few more final ideas. One is that operating systems often separate their jobs into multiple different lists. And basically you'll have a different list for different levels of priority. And the idea is then you can very simply just run all the tasks in the highest priority queue. Once there are no more tasks in the, in the highest priority queue, you move to the second, to the third, to the fourth, and so forth. This is basically just another way of implementing priority scheduling. So it has the same problems and the same solutions that we talked about earlier with SJF. And, and this is called multi-level queuing. Now a variation on this idea is called multi-level feedback queuing, and it's really the same except for one difference, and that is that you can move jobs from one queue to the other. Let's say that I wanna prioritize interactive processes to make interactive programs really fast. So when a process starts, I might just take all of its jobs and initially put them in the high priority queue because maybe I don't actually know if it's an interactive process or not. If it turns out that it has really short tasks, I'll just leave it there because it kind of looks like an interactive process. If on the other hand, I'm mistaken and its bursts are really long, then we'll just move it down to the next queue. And a process in a lower queue that starts issuing really short jobs, we could bump up and actually give it higher priority. I hope it's clear in this case that lower queues have lower priority but each queue could also use a longer scheduling quanta. And this has an interesting impact because it basically means that once we actually get down to those lower queues, that means that we don't have any high priority interactive processes that need to run. And so then we could actually say, instead of giving it 10 milliseconds to run, let's give it 80 milliseconds to run. And we'll spend less time on switching and actually try to more efficiently process some of these more computationally intensive jobs. So anyway, those are a few different ways that operating systems implement priority scheduling. And now we are about done for today, but I thought we should do something hands-on before we finish up. So let's look at Linux. For those in my class, I'm gonna talk a little bit about it when I get back. 
But today it's enough to just say that Linux uses a dynamic priority system, but those priorities are based on what we call nice values. A nice value is basically the opposite of priority. So a really high nice value means low priority. A really high nice value like 19 basically gives you very low priority. Your process is like, oh no, 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 uh, you go first. It's, you have the CPU, you need it more than I do, right? The process is really nice. A low nice value like negative 20 is like, give me the CPU now. By default, your programs probably have a nice value of zero and, and as a side note, you probably need super user privileges to set negative nice values. So now let's look at a specific example just so you can see how processes react with different nice values. So basically the program just forks and then each of the two processes do some useless computationally intense task, but with different nice values. When we run it, you can see that the higher nice value finishes last. You notice that the low priority task doesn't get starved. It doesn't have to entirely wait. It does finish later, but it still gets opportunities to run in there. It just gets fewer. For those in my class, make sure you play around with that nice example. Make sure you understand how it works. And I will see you on Tuesday. For the rest of you, I'll see you when I post my next video. And until then, I will see you later.